Okay. Uh, so, uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, so today we, we begin with uh, a first uh, talk by Manuel uh, Rodriguez Izquierdo. Um, yes, he was working with us here in observatory and now he's, he has position in, uh, in Mallorca, in Spain. And so the, the title is Filaments and Voids in Central Configurations. So please, Manuel, and please participants, please turn off the video. It's better, much better sometimes without video. Even Manuel, if, if there are some sounds problems, you can turn off the video. You can cry with with the video, but if... Okay. If not, I turn it off. Okay, no problem. So please, Manuel. Okay. Um, good morning to all. Uh, as Alan said, uh, I'm uh, Manuel Izquierdo, and I'm very grateful that uh, I have been invited here to talk in this uh, second edition of the Mate Maera Corana in honor of Professor Gildeberto Eulalio Cabral. And uh, basically, I'm going to present like some numerical results I obtained while I was working at uh, Los Abatois de Paris. And basically, what we wanted to do was to do uh, simulations of a Newtonian big bang in which uh, we started from a central configuration. So in order to do this, we had to compute a central configurations for a large number of bodies. We say large number, for example, for 100 bodies or for 1,000 bodies. And these are the results that we will uh, present in this uh, short talk. First, I will uh, briefly uh, review the main uh, embody equations and then explain what are the central configurations. Uh, I will give like a very rough estimate about like uh, how many central configurations do they exist for a given number of particles, that, but this is only uh, going to be in order to realize that um, it scales quite quickly as uh, we increase n, so we need a quantity, and this is the quantity that I uh, decided to call complexity that is related to the configurational measure in order to classify these central configurations. Then uh, I will briefly explain, explain uh, how I have been able to compute them and uh, uh, also with the gradient descent method. And mainly I use uh, a library for, from uh, Fortran that is called MIMPAC and it has a subroutine that is called hybrid that basically is some kind of adaptation of uh, the Powell's hybrid method that is also known as a Powell's doublet method. And uh, finally, I will present these central configuration equations of 1,000 bodies with, uh, in the case of minimal complexity and in the case of uh, random complexity. Well, as we all know, the embodied problem basically attempts to determine the possible motions of a given number of particles that follows Newton's inverse square law. And here we use this um, elegant formulation based on the gammas in which uh, basically is the negative acceleration of the particle and uh, we see that it does not depend on its own mass. The energy is defined as the uh, kinetic energy minus the uh, Newtonian potential. So because this is an extremely complex problem, the embodied problem, we have uh, the central configurations and basically they give rise to the only known explicit solutions of the embodied problem. Uh, more uh, formally, we can define it as uh, a configuration is central if there exists a vector and a point of reference and a constant lambda, it's basically a Lagrange mult multiplier, such that for all particles, there's a proportionality between the accelerations and the positions. In the case of uh, two dimensions, we call them planar, and in the case of three dimensions, we call them spatial. And here we can see, I mean, we will come back uh, to this point later, but here we can see in this figure, this is a um, central configuration of 1000 bodies, and this is in three dimensions, this is spatial. It is only rotating in order to be more easily, uh, to visualize more easily, that um, it is in uh, three dimensions. And basically its main property is that if we release uh, all the particles of this configuration without no initial velocity, they would homothetically collapse into their center of mass. And in all the numerical simulations I have performed, I have placed the center of mass in the, in the origin. So uh, how many central configurations do we have for a given number of bodies? The simplest case, it would be the collinear configurations that are the ones that uh, we have all the particles uh, along the same axis. Uh, this problem was already solved by Moulton in 1910. And uh, basically uh, he found that they are like n factorial divided two collinear central configurations. So for this way, the bodies can be ordered along a line. There is a unique position that causes a central configuration. From this question, it also emerges a conjecture from Wigner of 1941 in which basically he asked if the number of classes of planar central configuration is finite for a generic choice of masses. 
Uh, this uh, conjecture is still open and it uh, recently uh, was included in Smale's list of uh, one of the most important mathematical problems for this uh, century. And if we go to the, to the planar case uh, and, uh, of equal masses, that will be mainly uh, what we will talk in uh, here. Uh, the three-body problem, it was already solved a long time ago. We know that there are five. We know that uh, there are three, uh, three columnia that were found by Euler in uh, 1767. And other two uh, that are basically uh, the equilateral triangle uh, that were found by Lagrange in 1772. For the case of four bodies, uh, we know that 50 is the number of configurations in the case of equal masses, and we have some upper and lower bounds um, for the general case. And recently, in 2019, it was given a computer assisted proof by Mozart Siglinski for the case of uh, five, six, and uh, seven bodies. Uh, before, there have been other authors, like, for example, like, um, like Mokel or Ferrario, which they have uh, published uh, what they say like a complete list of uh, central configurations, but their algorithm was not designed in order to prove that that was the full list. But uh, this uh, problem was solved by Motsurat and Siglinski. And as uh, our algorithm, it, it would be closer to the one of Ferrario, for example, and um, we have been able to find uh, all the uh, central configurations up to 10 bodies that are included in Ferrario, but uh, as him, we cannot say that uh, those ones are the only central configurations. And we have obtained this result with an eight-digit precision. So before you were talking about uh, 1,000 bodies, and now you are talking up to seven bodies. So um, how many central configurations do we have, for example, for 1,000 bodies? Well, first, we need to establish a kind of criteria. So we say that if one configuration is deduced from the other by homotasy and rotation, we consider it to be the same configuration. So in order to give a qualitative rough estimate, it does not have like any numerical sense, but just like to give an intuition, I have decided to use um, a lower bound estimate by Palmer for the case of planar central configurations of equal masses. And here we have this expression that uh, it is not, uh, that in, it is not uh, proof, but um, if, for example, if we consider that all the particles are indistinguishable, we can like uh, like uh, get rid of less configurations, like uh, dividing by this factor, and we obtain more or less this expression. The idea basically is that uh, for 100 bodies, it gives around 10 to the 27. That is an extremely huge number. But for 1,000, it gives around 10 to the 297. So this makes uh, extremely difficult, like if you want to, to compute a complete list, for example, of 1,000 bodies, it's going to be extremely challenging. Uh, just like, uh, so you can get an idea. Here the result, I come back to the, back, uh, to the last uh, slide. Here the result from uh, Motsurat Siglinski for uh, seven bodies, it took them uh, 98 uh, computer hours. So for 1,000, the problem it escalates uh, quite quickly. And that's why we propose this uh, quantity called complexity. It's not something that uh, we have proposed in this work for the first time, as other authors have also used. But basically, it is a definition that is based on the moment of inertia that defines the size of the system. Here it would be the expression. And then using the fact that central configurations are critical points of uh, this function of the Newtonian potential multiplied by the square root of the moment of inertia, which is uh, in this context normally called the configurational measure, um, we can build this equation. Uh, the, one, of this uh, one of the main properties of this uh, quantity is that it's an homogeneous function of degree zero, so it's invariant under scaling, and it only, so it only depends on the shape. Here, what we do is like uh, basically the configurational measure, but with a renormalization factor. O sea, previously, in um, one of the first lists that was uh, published, of uh, this uh, list of uh, planar central configurations was by Mokel. And uh, also Ferrario, he used the same convention. And basically, they use the configurational measure in order to order their central configurations. And they set all the masses equal to one. And at least that I know, the first, uh, the first um, place that I have seen like uh, the explicit use of this quantity in order to classify them was in Motsurat Siglinski in 2019. And they use this quantity in order to uh, classify the central configurations. So what, uh, what numerical estimate can we have about this? I mean, like, uh, what do we know about um, this uh, quantity? Well, we don't know much, but uh, in 96 and 98, there was a researcher, Peter Lindstrom, and he uh, published uh, some uh, works relating to this fact. And uh, basically he found that uh, for the case of minimal complexity in the continuous limit, that uh, here it would be equivalent to 
uh, when the number of bodies approaches to infinity, he found that the only uh, value of complexity that is uh, unbounded is the one for the collinear, that it scales as a logarithmic of n. For the other two cases, it is um, it is bounded. And this is uh, our main motivation to uh, say that uh, probably, but this is a result that it has not been still proved, that um, the collinear configurations are the one that have the highest complexity. And for the case of random complexity, we don't, uh, we don't really know. Okay, so what would it be the computational scheme that we have uh, used? It has been a very simple uh, computational scheme. And basically, first we random initialize the particles, and then we have like two paths. First, we can uh, choose like a minimal complexity figure. These ones are like my, much easier to compute and uh, much faster. And uh, then we apply the gradient descent method, and then we uh, solve the central configuration equations, and then we see if uh, we have been successful or not successful. One of the main challenges of this problem is that uh, we have a set of 2n or 3n second order nonlinear differential equations. So it scales quite quickly as we increase the number of bodies. And one of the main computational tasks is that the total number of terms is quite high. It is, uh, it is proportional to n uh, squared. So uh, we need uh, we need to design like some tools like in order to avoid this uh, problem. One of the main uh, important um, considerations that I uh, found while I was doing uh, this kind of simulation was that the initial estimate, I mean like the initial conditions, they are extremely important. And that's the reason why here I suggest that if it fails, but uh, we have uh, positions of, a part of the particles that are close to a central configuration, but not really, we can take this output as the new input in order to uh, filter them again. For the case of random complexity, we can uh, go like a, like a pure uh, brute force and we can directly solve this, wait, sorry, like this uh, central configuration equations, or we can uh, do like a, something a little bit more elegant that is like uh, what we have uh, mainly done because it gives like a better result. And it's like first to apply the grand descent method. So we obtain here a configuration of minimal complexity, but because we don't know, uh, we, so we don't want a, a minimal one, we want a random one, we can slightly perturb this position and then solve again the central configuration equations. So um, the gradient descent uh, method we have in uh, we have um, we have used it because uh, it is extremely uh, simple to um, I mean, to, to um, it's a very simple method and it's also it's also quite fast. Basically, we uh, choose like uh, some initial conditions and like here we have like a stopping condition and until and until uh, it is uh, satisfied, we basically update the positions by this quantity. And this would be like the step size. We can also like uh, if, for example, if we are not or we are not obtaining a good convergence, we can like uh, like first like put a condition of a maximum number of iterations in order to okay like uh, if this is taking too long, maybe it's better to just like break it and start again. And uh, what which quantity do we have to minimize? Well, basically, these are the central configuration equations. If we assume that the total mass of the system is non-zero. Uh, then we can like substitute this point of reference for the center of mass. So uh, there's no, uh, if there's no external force applying to the center of mass, we would obtain this result. We fix the center of mass to the origin. Then we have like here, like definition of force. Then we would have here like these uh, equations. And knowing that uh, the moment of inertia is an homogeneous function of degree two, we can like uh, uh, simplify this expression by adding, by adding, um, by substituting here. And here uh, we would find that uh, this is the quantity that uh, we have to minimize. And in, uh, in um, and all of, of uh, one numerical simulations, we have used uh, the lambda equal to uh, one. Well, and now to the like, uh, like uh, important part is uh, how to solve the central configuration equations. And uh, basically I have used uh, a library for Fortran that it was uh, written, if I don't remember, but in 1980. And uh, originally it was written for Fortran, but now it has been adapted to C, to C++, and to Python. And basically, uh, it allows us to solve a set of n nonlinear differential equation with n variables. Uh, I have used this one because it is uh, extremely uh, easy to implement. And uh, the main key point, the only thing that we have to worry about, is uh, about um, a user supplying subroutine which calculates the functions. Because the Jacobian, uh, you don't need to um, you don't need like uh, to take it as an input. It is uh, computed by uh, first forward differences. 
So uh, one of the main characteristics of this algorithm is that it has like 11.5 n square arithmetic operations to process each call of the function. So this makes uh, that um, it will spend a lot of time uh, like uh, processing this function. And this function is complicated because it has like a, a large norm, a large number of uh, total terms. So like uh, the key in order to get these uh, central configurations, it would be to have a pretty good uh, subroutine that computes this function. And also like to choose an initial estimate that is close to the final approximate solution. And now uh, in order to check the accuracy of our simulations, it is uh, quite easy, like at least um, for the, um, I mean like at least for what we wanted. And is that uh, basically we only require that uh, the uh, center of mass, it has to be in the origin with an eight digit precision. And then we require that for all particles, uh, the maximum uh, value of this quantity, it has to be always, uh, it has to be a eight digit precision, precision or, uh, or more. And all the uh, figures that we will present in this, uh, this work, they have uh, satisfied this requirement. So, um, and, bueno, and a brief review of the of the Powell hybrid method. Basically, it is based on the trash region method. So, uh, basically, we uh, design a model function that uh, describes uh, our objective function in a in a region. What we want to do is we want to take like steps within our trash region in order to approach uh, the optimization uh, point. Uh, the Powell Douglas method, basically, what it does is uh, it's uh, more or less similar, but uh, First, it uh, computes um, the Newton point. If the Newton point is inside the trash region, then it is updated as a new position. If it is outside, then what we do is we compute a Cauchy point that is a uh, quite uh, easy to compute. If this Cauchy point is uh, outside the trash region, then we only take uh, we take like the intersection between the boundary, and I mean like the intersection between the boundary and the line that uh, the line segment that goes to the Cauchy point. And if it is inside, like for example, in this case, what we do is uh, we basically we draw uh, a line segment from the Cauchy point to the Newton point, and we take the intersection with the boundary. And this is why it is called dogleg method because somebody this part like it reminds to to, to a dogleg. And uh, okay, what would be the state of the art of computation of these central configurations? Well, it is important to mention that uh, like uh, the majority of the uh, approaches, they have been always to try to compute a complete list. Complete list we have until here, until n equals seven for the case of uh, equal masses. And Doiku, uh, here Doiku et al, uh, basically he designed an ectocastic algorithm in order to, uh, to try to compute till 12. But uh, their algorithm cannot, um, I mean, they are not completely sure that that is the complete list. For the case of a spatial central configuration, uh, in 2003 it was computed a spatial central configuration of uh, 500 bodies of minimal complexity. And recently, last year, it, it was given a complete list of the case of a spatial of uh, for five and six with uh, equal masses. And here uh, we, are, uh, we will present some spatial and planned central configuration of uh, 1,000 bodies. Here we have... Um, well, I forgot to mention that um, all in all these uh, numerical simulations, we have used equal masses. We have set the total mass equal to one, and we have set uh, lambda equal to one, and then the set of mass in the origin, uh, all satisfying this um, at least uh, eight-digit precision. And uh, this would be a kind of uh, animation in which, like, uh, there's an overlapping or uh, as we increase the number of bodies, and all of the all of these they are uh, planar central configuration of minimal complexity. At the beginning, they could appear that uh, what it would tend in the continuous limit is that they are uh, homogeneous, but this is far for, from truth. This would be a planar central configuration of 1,000 bodies, and here we can see that the density it is greater in the interior than in the outer layers. And this result was also was already a theoretical uh, proof by Lindstrom, the same uh, researcher I mentioned before. And basically, he found uh, he found like uh, this uh, density function. Then he also computed uh, for this uh, continuous limit uh, what should be like the what should be like the maximum value of the complexity, and it's zero point fifty nine and minus zero point fifty fifty seven. Basically, what uh, what uh, it could be is like uh, as we approach to uh, infinity, we reach this uh, we reach this value. Um, we have also been able to compute it for the spatial case. Here we have uh, of one thousand bodies. It is rotating, as I said before, uh, like in order to visualize that is um, in three dimensions. 
And uh, we have been able, successfully, able to uh, compute uh, the spatial central configuration of uh, 1,000 bodies of minimal complexity, but not for uh, random complexity. I mean, like that's a little bit more complex. And as we can see here, the uh, density function, it is uh, basically, it's, um, it's homogeneous. Well, as I said before, because um, of this uh, limit in which like uh, basically the complexity of the collinear is not uh, bounded, uh, we could, uh, we, we, we hypothesize that uh, the, the one of highest complexity is this one, that is the collinear one, that basically has this, um, this numerical value. And as we can see, this uh, the theoretical result of um, Lindstrom agrees with our numerical result, in which we can see that um, in, the, uh, in the center, the density is greater, as we can see here, like there's like uh, less particles, but here, like it seems like a, a completely continuous line. So one of the, I mean, like the title of this uh, presentation is filaments and voids in uh, central configurations. And uh, this is like, uh, the, I mean, like the motivation is that we have found like this kind of uh, filaments, like for example, in this figure and in this one, and uh, we don't know exactly why. I mean, like, I think uh, that uh, probably is because uh, uh, I mean, like the problem is that we here in these figures, we are quite close to the minimum. Uh, so we can see like uh, this value is quite similar to the one that I saw here. Uh, it is quite far away from this value that is supposed to be the maximum. So uh, basically what we uh, think is that as we increase uh, complexity, uh, probably this central configuration will, will tend to be closer to a collinear one. And that's why these filaments are formed. Here we can see uh, this one. This would be the third one, and this uh, last one, this is the one most complex I have found, but still, like, it is uh, quite close to the to the minimal complexity. Um, and it would be very interesting to uh, know how do they look like, the ones that are, like, closer to this uh, highest complexity. Then, bueno, this, bueno, this would be, like, the case of uh, for 100, that uh, these ones are, like, much uh, cheaper to compute. And this one I have found like uh, several ones and all of them, they show like their patterns. There's some that are like quite interesting, like for example, this one in which like uh, this is close to be a collinear and it separates these um, central configurations. And uh, we, we have, uh, we have uh, also been able to compute the spatial central configurations of uh, 200 bodies of random complexity. And here we can see that um, here like uh, filaments are also formed, like here it is quite clear. This is, looks like a, like a kind of a boomerang, and this is, uh, in my opinion, also an interesting result. So, what would be like a, what would be like a future research lines? Um, I would be very interested in knowing exactly why these filaments and voids form in the case of planar and spatial central configuration with random complexity, and also to know what can they tell us. Um, then it would be also interesting, like in order to check uh, how good is our uh, complexity function, if, if to know if there are non equivalent central configurations with the same numerical value. If uh, yes, then we should find another quantity, but if not, uh, maybe it's a, a good classification. Also, another quantity would be nice. And um, me personally, I mean, because I was doing this kind of uh, simulations with a high number of bodies, but uh, my limit was 1000, like, uh, because motivated by the fact that embodied simulations normally are done for a great number of bodies, uh, I would be uh, very interested in knowing how these uh, central conferences look like for a uh, great, I mean, like for at least like a four orders of magnitude more of uh, bodies. So uh, now I finish and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank you uh, Alan Albuy and Jacques Feyot, which uh, I work during my stay here at Observatoire and also uh, to uh, Julian Barbeau. Thanks a lot, Manuel. Uh, are there questions? Maybe I can just just uh, maybe propose some some uh, idea. Maybe yeah, is all, all the configurations we see in your work they are quite quite round. I mean, in kind of, in a disk, let's say. And maybe with higher complexity, it would not be 
like this probably yeah yeah i think like a, like a, like the reason of this is like because of the of the random initialization i choose i try to make them like a homogeneous in a in a surface like uh, in a in a like in a circle and they are like quite similar i mean like this is what i mentioned that the problem is that uh, they are like quite close to the one of uh, minimal complexity so yeah i think it would be interesting like to mm. like to try to go like to the other side but actually with the algorithm i i was working with with i think i would not be able to do it i mean i think i would like uh, have to change like the design of the system any question so i, I have a question um please, please we have you know very low uh, explorations for very low end you know n equals five six seven eight nine ten then you went to a hundred then you went to a thousand were you able to explore that, that leaves a lot of space in between to see how these patterns begin to emerge at what you know at what levels of n do these filaments begin to become uh, manifest have you been able to explore um, uh, ranges of n growing up from 10 to 100 to a thousand or is it <laughs> enough work simply to be able to do those steps yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that's interesting. I mean, like I have basically I have uh, done that range, like from uh, like from three to one hundred. I have computed uh, a lot of them, and like this is, I mean, like this is, uh, I mean, this is relevant because like for one hundred they are like very fast to compute, but the problem is that for one thousand they take a long time. But like between like one hundred, I have also compute of two hundred and five hundred, mm -hmm. and like in all of them, like for example, five hundred they look uh, more or less similar to the one of um, of uh, 1000 i mean like in the case of random complexity but maybe it, like this experiment i think maybe it could be nice like to do it like let's say with 50 with 50 you can still see like these filaments and they are like uh, quite fast to compute maybe and if i can ask one more question so at this yes. point you've observed these you've observed these patterns begin to form these filaments and voids and did I understand correctly? At this point, you don't really have any sort of export explanation or categorization of what these mean. You simply, you're observing them. Is, is, did I yes, hear that I, correctly? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's exactly that. I mean, like what what I think, but I cannot uh, like uh, really. You know, I mean, like my justification is that uh, like because I I think that the one with highest complexity are the collinear ones. I think that these filaments are formed as we increase complexity. But in fact, I'm not uh, completely satisfied with this uh, with this explanation. Yeah. So I in fact, like I thank you. thank you. Another another question. Yeah. Maybe I can ask question to Chris. <laughs> what what do you think of this conjecture that the uh, collinear is as a minimal co complexity always minimal potential maybe falls. Um, certainly, collinear stands out very distinctive among planar um, and among spatial. Uh, planar among spatial, we know, is, is trickier, but collinear have always sort of stood out clearly at one extreme. So ex thinking of them as a extrema is, is very plausible given what we know. Thank you. Any question? So maybe we pass to the next speaker, Susanna. Uh, yeah, we can come to Manuel again. <laughs> So, the, so now we, are, we have the pleasure to, to listen to Susanna Terracini from uh, Torino, and uh, it's about uh, about galaxies and so on. So, <laughs> refraction trajectory in central mass galaxies. Okay. Uh, so please okay. turn out the video again. And... Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, please, Susanna, you can go. 
Yes. Can you see my can you see my screen? It is very small at the moment. We see a small screen. Okay, and like this, can you see? La, yeah, yes, La, now it's okay. Thanks. Okay, so first I would like to thank the organizers for uh, this uh, invitation. I'm very happy to be here, uh, so virtually. And uh, what I'm going to share with you uh, today is uh, are some results uh, about the refraction trajectories in central ma mass galaxies that I've been uh, obtaining in collaboration with Irene de Blasi. Uh, okay, so I will first introduce the problem and then uh, I will uh, uh, talk about uh, two kinds of results, uh, the stability of homothetic solutions and uh, the case of uh, small perturbation of the circle. Okay, let me go to the introduction. Uh, one possible view on what I'm going to discuss uh, today is uh, to uh, look uh, at the problem as a kind of billiard. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there, there will be uh, some important differences with respect to billiards, to bit of billiards, because uh, we will still have an inside and an outside. Uh, the in, in, within the inside, uh, 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 rays will be curved by a central uh, Kepler potential. Uh, outside, uh, there will be, there will, uh, be uh, uh, trajectories of uh, 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 harmonic oscillators. Okay, and in between, there will be some some uh, 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 refraction I, I will discuss. So if you like one possible uh, uh, way of looking at this pro problem is to see this uh, as uh, a class of uh, billiards and try uh, to, 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 um, to look at the, the uh, analogies and differences uh, for what concerned uh, the, the, the general problem of trajectories, uh, the caustics, uh, and so on. I have to say that maybe the, the uh, closest uh, uh, type of billiards that have been investigated recently are the inverse magnetic billiards by Gazioli. So uh, we uh, actually uh, started this, uh, this uh, investigation uh, when uh, we uh, came uh, uh, in, in contact with uh, uh, Christopher Timiolkoulos, who brought to our attention a paper that he had uh, published with uh, two collaborators, uh, Davis and Kalapa Tarokrakos, uh, where you have an elliptic galaxy with a supermassive black hole in its center. And uh, they, in, the, in that case, uh, using analytical and, and but mainly the numerical approaches, they prove the chaoticity of this uh, problem. So what is uh, the model? There is uh, an ellipsoid where there is a constant mass density and a black hole of some mass mu in the, in the center. And uh, then uh, uh, what happens is that uh, outside, uh, this elliptical shell, uh, you, uh, the, the, the particle uh, uh, will uh, uh, have a potential which is a harmonic potential, maybe uh, an isotropic one, while inside uh, the uh, potential will be the Kepler potential. Uh, for, uh, we, for a symmetry reason, we can uh, study uh, uh, a planar uh, uh, case, uh, if we think, for example, of taking uh, the uh, intersection with the xy uh, uh, plane. And we study the motion of a particle in R2. Uh, okay, so the, this, uh, this uh, model is motivated by, by consideration in, uh, in uh, uh, astro astro like in astrophysics, uh, but uh, also there is another interpretation. If we, one could think of uh, 
studying in fact uh, rays uh, rays uh, in within uh, materials that has have to, uh, are somehow artificial and try to design meta materials uh, having some uh, particular uh, uh, optical uh, characteristics and uh, so uh, this discontinuity in the potential accounts for inhomogeneity of the materials so we can uh, think of possible applications in uh, uh, optical in des uh, designing and uh, artificial optical devices so, uh, of course, we are more interested in the fact that this is uh, uh, maybe it is an interesting uh, um, uh, class of Hamiltonian systems uh, where we see uh, the, the interaction of two very particular ones, uh, the harmonic oscillators and uh, the Kepler potential, which both enjoy the same property, that is that, uh, in general, they do have... Uh, uh, all that the property that all bounded orbits are periodic, and uh, in our case, uh, so we it, I think it is uh, interesting to understand uh, how they uh, um, uh, what is the, their uh, uh, interplay when uh, they communicate uh, through a given interface. So uh, now we have uh, a, an interior. Uh, sorry, an exterior potential uh, with some energy, exterior uh, energy H and uh, a frequency of oscillation, which is omega square, and an interior one where there is a, a Kepler potential with a certain given, uh, a given uh, energy. Uh, where, so these are Eps, uh, E, mu, omega, and H are uh, parameters. Actually, H need, needs not to be positive. But E is positive, and so is E plus H and mu. And uh, so, what are uh, uh, our trajectories concatenate inner hyperbolic arcs with outer elliptic arcs, and they uh, are connected. Sorry, uh, are connected at the boundary with uh, uh, by a Snell uh, refraction law. So uh, when the when the ray uh, touches uh, the the interface, uh, it forms with the with the uh, normal direction and an angle alpha, and then it is refracted, forming uh, uh, an angle beta. And uh, as, uh, the, uh, the sinus of alpha and the sinus of beta are related by this proportionality law, uh, which involves uh, the uh, the uh, potential, the square root of the potentials on the two sides. Okay. Well, this is uh, this uh, refraction law is in fact a, a generalization of uh, uh, refraction of Snell's law, and uh, well, it is related uh, with uh, the uh, variational interpretation of uh, of uh, uh, rays. Uh, in the following sense, uh, the conservation of the tangent component of the velocity vector passing through uh, um, the, the, the interface corresponds to uh, the uh, uh, minimization of the total length. Uh, so, just to, to to be precise on the on this uh, on this point, uh, we think of having some metric. And uh, uh, so the length, the uh, in Riemannian metric in R2, so we are given a certain matrix. Uh, so the length of an arc is, as usual, uh, the integral of the length of the, uh, of the uh, derivative of the, of the vector with respect to this, uh, to this metric. And uh, the distance is just, uh, the distance of, uh, of two points is just, uh, the minimum, the length of the minimal length uh, uh, arc uh, joining this, uh, these two points. Then uh, you see when we have uh, uh, an interface sigma and we, we can take uh, two points uh, on the two opposite side and connect them with uh, uh, 
two arts uh, joining at a point uh, Z on, the, on this interface. And now uh, let's uh, look uh, A and B, uh, Z A and Z B are, are fixed. And uh, on the two sides, you have different metrics uh, with a possible jump uh, of the coefficient at C. And then uh, we look uh, at the uh, uh, position of the, of the point on the, on the interface, uh, which minimizes uh, the sum of the distances between the, uh, uh, the uh, two points uh, and uh, this uh, third point. And then if this is uh, just a computation, is uh, when we look uh, at uh, the optimality condition, so of course uh, uh, there will be some, uh, some uh, 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 derivative with respect to this, uh, this uh, point uh, Z, which has to uh, annihilate. And if you look at uh, what happens, you in fact uh, uh, see that uh, uh, this corresponds exactly to this uh, length, to this uh, uh, Snell law. So when, sorry, oh. okay. So if you look at this uh, figure, when you find uh, the optimal the, the optimal path uh, through Z, so the one that minimizes uh, the total length. Uh, uh, then uh, the uh, uh, relation between the, uh, the, the sin, uh, sinus of uh, the, the angle is verified. So this is uh, the right uh, uh, connection rule uh, join, uh, in order to have uh, a minimization uh, property for the rays. And uh, if you look closer at this condition, then you understand that, uh, uh, for example, if you assume that the potential inside is always larger than the potential outside, so the jump uh, is in favor of uh, the, the, the potential inside, then the refraction from out to in, for the outer region in the inner region, is always possible. While well, the inverse is not always possible and requires, so if you want to pass from the inner region to the outer region, you must go to the interface with an angle which is sufficiently small, an angle with a normal which is sufficiently small. Okay, if you go, if you go in a two tangent way, you cannot pass through. Okay. Uh, so uh, now what we, we do, uh, we uh, uh, consider the, our boundary, which is uh, now a circle, it has no reason of being a circle, which has a parametrization and uh, points uh, uh, at, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, boundary are then uh, uh, the images of uh, a certain gamma uh, parametrization gamma of uh, xi, xi, and then we uh, consider uh, as uh, um, uh, as uh, uh, angles uh, alpha alpha zero uh, the uh, angle the the initial velocity. Okay, so we uh, now we consider. We start uh, from this uh, from this point with this uh, with this angle. We solve uh, the uh, the uh, we find an outer arc uh, which crosses uh, the surface at a, a new point. At this point, uh, this at this point we have a refraction. Uh, we start with this uh, new velocity and uh, we. So we, we, we find a, a, a Kepler uh, hyperbola here, which will cross again the, the, the boundary and then it will be refracted again. And this is, uh, uh, a, well, uh, it is a second return, but uh, we will call it first re return. The uh, map that maps uh, Xi zero alpha zero into Xi one alpha one. Okay, so there are, uh, you have, uh, we have uh, two 
arcs and two refractions. Uh, in general, this map is not well defined. Uh, for generic uh, domains, it is not. Uh, it requires an, uh, some conditions. Uh, the first uh, is that uh, so from the point uh, Xi0 to Xi1, there, is, uh, there should be a unique outer arc and you need a uh, unique inner arcs. And also there is this problem of uh, uh, the criticality of uh, the uh, angle of the intersection. Okay, and then we have another difficulty because at the gravity center, uh, the inner potential is not defined, but this will be overcome by taking advantage of levi civita regularization and we will extend all motions through the uh, uh, center of gravity by uh, a complete refle uh, reflection. Okay. Uh, okay. So if you look at, uh, at this, uh, there are very special solutions. Uh, at each point uh, where half lines uh, uh, exiting from the gravity, gravity center intersect, intersect the boundary in a uh, normal with, uh, with in a normal way. So you, we have orthogonal intersection. Then uh, corresponding to this uh, to this point, uh, we have a collision homothetic periodic solution. That is a, a solution that uh, are keep uh, the same. Uh, the, which take place on one half line. And uh, uh, of course, uh, at this point, uh, there is uh, the refraction is just, uh, 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 the refraction is just a boost of the normal velocity city through the boundary of T. Okay, now when we look, uh, uh, when we look at this particular orbit, we are, immediately uh, 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 pushed to uh, study their stability, okay? Just to, to start having uh, some insight on the, on the dynamics, okay? And uh, uh, so, as I said, uh, outside we have, uh, uh, on radial directions, we have a homotopic orbits, and then in the inner dynamics, uh, we will have uh, uh, completely refre uh, reflection through the gravity center. Okay, and then we, in, in the inner part, uh, we will uh, use, we will perform a Levi-Civita regularization. And this is very nice uh, because for those who know Levi-Civita uh, regularization, that in complex, uh, uh, in complex notation, say that uh, our uh, variable uh, z of s is uh, the square of uh, new variables uh, w and then we will also have to reparameterize time and then through this uh, change of uh, space and time this new variable this new function uh, in fact solves uh, again a linear problem a linear problem with uh, um, uh, uh, in fact, which is in fact uh, a harmonic repulsor with uh, 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 frequency uh, the uh, e plus h. Okay, so we have this uh, very well known fact, uh, and this will be can be used in order to. Uh, Linearize uh, the problem uh, at uh, the these uh, these uh, the homothetic these uh, homothetic periodic solutions. Uh, well, th at first we have to to prove uh, that uh, the map is well defined locally in a neighborhood of uh, this uh, homothetic solution, and then uh, so the stability properties uh, will be derived from. Uh, the spectrum of the Jacobian matrix, uh, and uh, we, which can be uh, computed by linearized uh, the map F uh, around the homothetic solutions. Okay, so uh, to start with, 
we uh, consider the generating functions for the inner and outer dynamics. What are the uh, generating functions? Are just uh, the uh, distances with respect to the Jacobi metric uh, inside the and, out, uh, and outside. Okay. So, uh, okay. So uh, we we can uh, uh, keeping this in mind, we can uh, define we can define the, a cycle called outer and inner uh, by solving this the problem uh, with respect to this uh, uh, point uh, uh, tilde xi, which is uh, the 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 junction of the inner and outer arc at the at the boundary and uh, this map can be in fact uh, uh, studied by for example the, if we if we are uh, uh, per performing a local study around a homothetic uh, uh, a homothetic solution we can uh, define the 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 uh, uh, this uh, the map uh, by using uh, uh, transversality methods ba basically and uh, uh, an implicit function theorem. So we can uh, uh, deduce uh, the, 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 the form of the Jacobian uh, of uh, the, the, the map uh, by these uh, informations. And uh, uh, now we can we, we, we must uh, uh, study, the second derivatives of the uh, generating functions. And to do this, we have to linearize the inner and the outer, uh, around the inner and the, and the outer maps, the, the inner and the, uh, and the outer trajectories uh, close to the uh, homothetic ones. This is very easy to be done where in the outside region, because the, the problem is already linear, so the linearization is particularly easy. Uh, while in the, the interior uh, part, uh, the system becomes linear after performing the uh, Levi Civita regularization. And so, with uh, let's say uh, some uh, uh, more, let's say, in a more a bit, bit, bit more uh, involved computation we can in any case uh, uh, find the this uh, the this linearization uh, there are some elements which are important uh, let me i will not discuss in details but uh, in these elements uh, which will finally for, uh, form the differential of the outer part of the maps uh, there are uh, in, there, there is there are the curvatures uh, involved and uh, the role of the curvatures at the boundary of the configuration at the boundary will be uh, will be, will be uh, uh, very important in discussing the the stability of this uh, of the uh, of of the homothetic solution Okay, then uh, what we, 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 we do, well, conceptually, is very easy. We studied uh, the linear stability of these uh, 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 periodic points of the maps. And we know that when we can, uh, uh, when we can uh, uh, compute the Jacobian and we look at the eigenvalues, then uh, uh, we will have uh, uh, a, an unstable saddle point where the discrete the characteristic uh, polynomial uh, discriminant is positive and uh, it will be a stable center point in a linearized way when the discriminant is negative. Okay, so uh, what happens is that uh, uh, with this, uh, with some uh, passion, we can write uh, this discriminant uh, uh, as uh, the, the, the pro product of terms uh, which are functions of. Uh, the uh, distance uh, from the center of the of the configuration psi the the, the, the homothetic configuration the curvature at the point and the physical parameters uh, e mu uh, omega and h 
and uh, one can uh, see that in fact uh, there, there are there might be by bifurcations there, there are different regimes uh, in particular in the, the case of elliptic domains uh, we can uh, uh, we have uh, explicit com computation uh, we have uh, so we take an, an elliptic uh, uh, domain with eccentricity e and then in this case we have four homothetic solutions uh, two vertical and two horizontal uh, well let me uh, just uh, uh, notice that uh, when the, the domain is circular then the map is globally well defined and it is also integrable and it is actually a shift Okay, is the shift in the angle and also has an explicit formula which involves uh, all the physical parameters. Uh, and uh, when uh, the eccentricity is very small, then uh, the map uh, is uh, a small perturbation of the map on the, on the circle. Notice that uh, in the map of, of the circle, all uh, configurations uh, are all, all uh, uh, there is a there, there are infinitely many periodic solutions all uh, homothetic orbits are uh, are, uh, are uh, uh, admissible and uh, if you uh, look uh, well, at the expansion in the um, eccentricity of the discriminants of the uh, horizontal and the vertical ones, then one sees uh, that the first term in the in the in the uh, in this expansion are equal uh, but in the sign, and so the two uh, the two horizontal and vertical homothetic uh, uh, periodic solutions have the opposite uh, stabilities. But uh, in fact, uh, this which which one may depends uh, on the physical parameters. Okay, so there are uh, special regimes. For example, when the energies go, the energy go to infinity, or the uh, mass of the of the black hole go, goes to infinity, and uh, that show that uh, you may uh, also have. Uh, that uh, other regimes uh, where when uh, the uh, the uh, two have the same stability okay so uh, there might be both subtle there might be uh, uh, even both uh, uh, stable so uh, the one, one sees that varying this parameter, there is a, a rather uh, complex uh, picture of, uh, of uh, periodic solution. And uh, uh, so in some regimes, it is uh, clear that uh, this, uh, the, the homothetic solution do not exhaust all the periodic solutions. And there, uh, my, there must be other type of uh, of uh, periodic solution, and in particular, one can look, seek a period, periodic solution of period two, which are which correspond to break, break orbits. Okay, so there are two distinct uh, homothetic outer arcs which are refracted and uh, uh, connected by a Keplerian arc. These are also special uh, uh, solutions that uh, uh, can be studied by studying the free fall map and in fact uh, one can prove that uh, um, uh, the free fall map is uh, defined well defined at least in some ranges of uh, the eccentricities and uh, uh, there are uh, points uh, um, uh, there are pe uh, periodic points uh, of minimal period two corresponding to four two periodic break orbits, uh, uh, pairwise uh, geometrical coincidence. Okay, so if you, if we look, if you try to, if, if we try to uh, uh, look uh, at uh, 
like the global pictures picture we see that uh, these uh, sorry these uh, 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 there are ranges uh, where there are uh, uh, opposite uh, uh, opposite uh, stability of the uh, horizontal and vertical homothetic which uh, undergo a bifurcation uh, because at, at some point they become both uh, uh, unstable and uh, this uh, uh, bifurcation creates new points, new periodic points of period two. Uh, and uh, again, there, are, uh, there might be other changes of stability and regions where these, uh, these uh, periodic points, uh, per periodic orbits uh, uh, um, bifurcate and create some multiplicity. Uh, this uh, picture is somehow uh, uh, in contrast with what, what happens with the Birkhoff billiards, because for, bir billi for such billiards, uh, the uh, uh, homothetic, the, let's say, the uh, homothetic uh, uh, orbits, so the bouncing orbits, vertical and horizontal, uh, never changes, always keep the same stability. Okay, so this is uh, uh, something, uh, uh, as a, as a, uh, an interesting behavior. And also one sees uh, that uh, uh, for, value, for selected values of the parameters, uh, uh, one sees the appearance of period three, at least one can see numerically, the uh, uh, appearance of uh, chaotic regions uh, and uh, uh, period three and uh, a cascade of periodic solutions. So these are a picture when the uh, internal energy H is raised from two to 10 to 40. These are also numerical, uh, on only numerical uh, um, results. Okay, now, uh, let's uh, uh, examine the, the problem uh, from the point of view of the perturbation of the boundary. We start from the uh, from the circle and we perturb it with some function, function f. So when epsilon is zero, the boundary is just a parametrization of, of the circle. And uh, when uh, epsilon is different from zero, this uh, uh, boundary is perturbed in a reasonably smooth ma manner. Uh, and then we can compute uh, or try to compute uh, the uh, generating functions, uh, the perturbed generating functions, and to look them from a perturbation, uh, perturbation uh, point of view. Um, in general, uh, we have uh, we can uh, uh, refer to the canonical actions associated with the, this the uh, generating function, and uh, uh, we um, find that the, the map can be, uh, in fact, uh, globally defined uh, when the um, uh, when okay when the, the unperturbed generating functions satisfy some non-degeneracy condition and this non-degeneracy condition now is written here in a rather uh, uh, let's say uh, obscure way but uh, uh, will be related, very much related, with the twist uh, uh, condition of the unperturbed map, the twist of, of the unperturbed map. Uh, so uh, the uh, in, in this in so now we have uh, basically a conservative, uh, uh, an area preserving perturbation of uh, a given, uh, a given uh, uh, twist map. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, we will take advantage of Poincaré-Birkhoff, uh, 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 mother theory and KM theory. Just notice that in any case, uh, the actions, the canonical actions uh, 
uh, are bounded, there is an admissible interval for them, and this interval is, uh, the, the boundedness of this uh, interval is due to this uh, 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 obstacles to the refraction from the interior to the, uh, to the uh, outside, which are connected with this uh, total ref uh, refraction, total reflection uh, uh, fact uh, that uh, uh, I, I have uh, mentioned before. Okay, so uh, we have uh, uh, now we uh, consider the uh, set of the admissible action and then we look for the unperturbed case for, uh, 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 for which values uh, uh, the unperturbed map uh, is uh, twist. And uh, this, uh, in fact, uh, is, uh, the, is something we can, uh, ha that has a certain expression. And uh, when it is uh, uh, not twist, it may happen uh, that uh, the, the, the twist condition is violated only on, in a finite number of uh, points. Uh, this set may also be uh, empty, at least uh, at uh, uh, a numerical investigation in, uh, in many cases. But there are parameters, uh, physical parameters, for which, in fact, the map is not uh, twist for all values of the action. And uh, the twist uh, uh, condition is reversed when passing through some critical uh, set critical value of the, of the action. So this is, a, a, let's say, a fact. We cannot uh, uh, do better. But uh, uh, when we exclude these, uh, these, uh, uh, critical, uh, these uh, critical values of the actions, then, uh, uh, when, then we can uh, apply uh, uh, the, for example, Birkhoff-Lewis theorem, and uh, find uh, orbits uh, which are of n uh, m type, uh, so have uh, some relation, uh, some rotation, some given rotation, uh, rotation uh, number, uh, and uh, of course we can do this for the unperturbed. Uh, problem and uh, we uh, uh, this will be then uh, the, the, so our, our point of view will be to continue this uh, uh, periodic solution having some rotation number into the unperturbed problem. Um, let me also uh, notice that for the unperturbed case uh, associated with uh, in all, all, all with the invariant curve curves that we have in the unperturbed case, as I said, it is uh, the map is integrable, and uh, the uh, uh, so we have uh, uh, all uh, constant uh, uh, action uh, uh, are, are invariant curves related to each invariant curve. We have we have a pair of ca caustics. Caustics uh, are uh, classic, can be classified in interior and uh, uh, inner and outer caustics, and in for the unperturbed case, they are just uh, the uh, locus of the uh, points having minimal and maximal distance from the center. And uh, when okay, so uh, when we um, uh, think of perturbing the, the set, the, 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 the set, when, then uh, the map will be perturbed and will be still well, well defined, provided the uh, perturbation K of the boundary is smooth enough. And in fact, when we, when you take, uh, when we take a CK perturbation of uh, the circle, then the map loses two degrees of differentiability and will be uh, uh, of class K, K minus two. 
Okay, and then we can uh, look at the uh, at the, the problem as a perturbation in a, in a, as a perturbation problem of an integrable system, and we see that uh, in fact the map uh, is a perturbation of the shift, and uh, the perturbation is of cl class C k minus two, where when uh, uh, where k is the degree of differentiability. Of, uh, of the uh, uh, of uh, the, the the boundary, and uh, let us uh, uh, look. The, let us see that uh, if we uh, look at the angle theta as a function of i, the one uh, of the shift. Uh, if we look at the shift uh, as a function of the action, then there might be changes of the monotonicity. And uh, we have, of course, to keep uh, these uh, changes, to keep control of these changes, and to avoid points uh, where the, uh, the, this derivative is, uh, uh, is, uh, is zero. And this amounts of uh, considering uh, some uh, uh, selected intervals uh, of, uh, of, possible, uh, of possible actions. Uh, to be uh, properly perturbed. Okay, now we take uh, Diophantine uh, frequency and we can uh, uh, apply KM theory, uh, KM theorem. Uh, in this case, uh, we use uh, the version of Hermann that says that the degree of differentiability of F and G should be strictly larger than three. This means for us uh, that the boundary should be uh, 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 a, per a small perturbation of class strictly larger than five. And then, uh, uh, and in these circumstances, we can apply uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, KM theory, uh, the Hermann uh, uh, theory about the, the existence of invariant curve with a given the rotation number, which is a uh, uh, diophant. Okay, and uh, then what we can do, we can uh, uh, find, try to use two invariant curves, two KM uh, uh, invariant curves, and uh, to use them as uh, barriers uh, to confine uh, the dynamics uh, in a certain range of the cylinder. And we, when we have done this, we can also uh, select uh, strips, uh, or let's say uh, uh, perturbed strips, uh, where the uh, map is also twist. And with this, uh, in our hand, we can use poincare birkhoff theorem and find the periodic solutions with uh, uh, given uh, rotation numbers uh, uh, in uh, this, uh, uh, in between uh, the rotation numbers of the uh, two uh, uh, two invariant curves that bound our invariant regions. And uh, uh, okay, let me. Uh, uh, okay, so we can uh, also apply Obrim other theorems in this uh, in this setting and uh, uh, find uh, uh, periodic and quasi-periodic uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, trajectories, uh, 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 orbits, uh, having uh, uh, prescribed uh, uh, rotation numbers. Okay, and uh, let me just, uh, I'm, I'm also uh, almost finished. Uh, let, let me again, uh, uh, point out uh, that the, in connection, in a, a relation with uh, uh, any of these invariant curves, there are inner and outer orbits uh, that can be studied and are also small, per, small perturbation of the caustics uh, of the uh, uh, unperturbed case. Uh, there is uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, now, uh, this is uh, somehow similar to the case of the billiard, of the, uh, of the Birkhoff billiard, but uh, again with a difference. Uh, for example, it is not clear that you can uh, 
that uh, given any pair of caustics, uh, there is uh, an interface uh, for which uh, these are uh, true caustics. Uh, while the famous La Lazutkin uh, uh, example shows that this is the case uh, for the uh, for the billiards, and in general the relation between ca caustics and and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, this type of billiards is not is not so clear. Okay, what uh, will be our further research? Uh, well, uh, the first uh, we will would like to prove uh, the existence of, uh, some, of chaotic motions and symbolic, symbolic dynamics, uh, at least uh, in some ranges of the physical parameters. And uh, then, uh, of course, uh, a take on the problem by uh, looking at the, the uh, classification of uh, the integrable case with respect to the physical parameters in our examples. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, I think it is uh, very uh, interesting to uh, study the inverse caustic problem. So when uh, given two regular closed curves, uh, there is a domain D for which uh, these are, in fact, uh, the caustics of uh, the associated uh, billion. Uh, this is different from the case of classical uh, bi uh, Birkhoff uh, uh, billiards because uh, of the uh, interaction of the two uh, ca caustics. Uh, uh, so it is uh, it is uh, different. Okay, so this is uh, uh, was my 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 talk, and this is the end. Thank you very much. For your uh, attention, I'm a bit lost because I don't see any, anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
But the, if the boundary has a rotational symmetry, then this is not the case. Okay, thank you. Yes. Sorry, in the, in the sense that the two angular momenta are different in the inner and outside region, but each time you cross, you will go back to the, to the, the angular momenta you had when you left it the last time. Okay, thank you. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Any any question? So uh, let me ask an another question. Let's see. Do, do you have uh, other cases of integrability without uh, out of the circle? Uh, surprising cases or? Uh... Okay. Uh, uh, we don't know. What we know. And we are studying now that we have for well first uh, as you as you as you know is that it, it's rather difficult uh, both to prove integrability and non-integrability okay so in a, in a rigorous way uh, when you when you look at the at the at the classical billiard then the elliptical case is integrable and this is a not completely trivial, but can be proved. We cannot prove uh, uh, integrability for our elliptical refraction billiards. What we can prove is that, uh, in fact, uh, there are cases uh, also, apparently also for elliptical uh, refraction billiards, uh, where uh, the, uh, the mo motion is chaotic. So there is a symbolic dynamics which, uh, uh, somehow prevents analytic uh, uh, integrability. Okay, uh, but uh, we don't have uh, uh, cases uh, where we, different from the circular one, when we can prove integrability. Thank you. Uh, any question again? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Yes, thank Susanna again.